بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب The Prophet وسلم, described for us how things are basically divided into two categories the halal and the haram and that in between those two categories is another category which is the doubtful matters those things which are doubtful which we really don't know and Islam encourages us to protect ourselves in every way protect our intellect protect our bodies physically protect our uh, our souls protect our honor and protect our our property and the things that we possess our families and so forth and by avoiding the doubtful things you safeguard and protect yourself and of course avoiding the haram you protect yourself and you protect those things which Islam encourages us to protect and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam articulated this with perfection alayhi salatu wasalam and gave us this qaida azim on how to practice our lives and how to safeguard our honor and our respect our families and our souls and ourselves an abi abdullah nu'man ibn bashir radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينهما أمور مشتبهة لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس فاتقوا شبهات قال صلى الله عليه وسلم فمن اتقى شبهات فقد استبر في دينه وعرده ومن وقع في شبهات وقع في الحرام الى اخر حديث the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said as reported by نعمان بن بشير ابي عبد الله رضي الله تعالى عنه who said i heard the messenger of allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say verily the halal the lawful things are clear and the haram is clear and the unlawful things are clear because they're mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and between that halal and that haram are things which are doubtful that many of the people are unaware of so whoever fears or protects himself from the doubtful things has safeguarded guarded his deen and his honor and whoever enters into those doubtful things will fall into the haram this hadith probably needs very doesn't need require much explanation that it's very clear that in Islam things are there are things that are lawfully clear and there we we know them from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the fact that there's some qawaid or some principles that are derived from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which show us for example that the asla muamalat ibaha that the origin of everything in this world is that it's permissible that it relates to uh, interactions 
transactions and uh, clothing and food. The origin of it all is that it's all halal and it's permissible unless there comes a text or evidence to show us that it is haram and the evidence would come from the Quran and the Sunnah or from what the ulama have have consensus upon or what uh, is clear from correct analogy from something else make it an analogy from something else which is haram to determine that this is haram because they share a uh, uh, the same reason for its prohibition or what have you or from the same hikmah so the origin of things is that it's it's permissible and on the other hand the opposite the origin of worship is that it's prohibited al asla ibadah mahdhur or that the origin of any kind of worship any act of worship ibadah is that it's impermissible unless you have something from the sharia from the quran and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to illustrate that it's permissible so for example that's why we pray like we pray because it's it's been clarified for us otherwise everyone would have their own way of worshiping allah some people would sing and dance some people would say, well, you know, through music, I find such peace through jazz, through soft hip hop, through whatever opera, whatever kind of music that a person finds that they find some sort of contentment with, that they would use that as a type of worship. And, and in fact, I know many people who do that are non-Muslim who consider that such a spiritual uh Force that music is such a spiritual force that it moves them to such a great extent that they consider that that is their communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is their relationship with their Lord, tabarak wa ta'ala. But in fact, in Islam, we know that that's not permissible. And that's because we have religious texts which show for us and illustrate for us what correct worship is. So that's why we pray as we pray. We don't pray and make communion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through music. And we don't uh, make certain kinds of dhikr which the Prophet wasallam didn't do. For example, some people, they recite some of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they just say Allahu, Allahu, Allahu so many times until spit dribbles from their chin and they consider that this is a type of worship and a way to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but that wasn't legislated so we would say that that is muharram and that is bid'ah that is innovation and that is impermissible because it's not authenticated that the Prophet sallallahu and his sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in did that so the asl of ibadat is that it is muharram, is that it is impermissible unless something from the sharia shows that it is permissible. So for the mu'min, they should stay away from those doubtful things. Do those things which are clear. Stay away from those shubahat. And that's why a lot of people, those people who fall into bid'ah, religious innovation, and heretical practices, heresy, that it is due to the fact that they go into the shubahat. They go to those things which they don't have knowledge about, whether it's permissible or impermissible, and they just go into it. And they have an intention to come closer to Allah, but instead they're going further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're doing the, that which is not legislated by the sharia. And a true story that happened to me when I was a new Muslim, I recall I was in Berkeley, California, doing a special program at the University of California in Berkeley, a very prestigious university. And I met some brothers who were Sufi. And me at the time, I was just finding myself 
trying to learn more about Islam, but I was also very much into my other studies. And I had dreadlocks at that time. And this particular individual had dreadlocks as well, very beautiful dreadlocks. He was a very handsome man as well, and he used to wear a thobe, very fair-skinned, a nice brown color, and very long, beautiful dreadlocks. He had been growing his dreadlocks for at least 10 years or more, and they were very long, and he, uh, you know, women were very attracted to him, and he was very appealing to the eye. And his speech was very appealing and attractive. And he used to say to the people, Muslim and non-Muslim, he used to call them beloved. He used to always call, address me as beloved. He said, oh, beloved, you know, such and such and such and such. And I remember I was having a difficult time because I was in a co-ed environment, a co-ed dorm, meaning that men and women shared the dorm rooms on the Berkeley campus. And I was a new Muslim and I was trying to do right. I was trying to be halal and a lot of my companions were women that I studied with from all kind of backgrounds. And it was a test for me. And I explained, you know, I'm a Muslim. So, you know, we, you know, my only kind of relationship that's lawful for me is marriage. And my friend at the time, this brother, may Allah guide us in him. kept trying to convince me to do the shibahat, to go into something I had no knowledge about. He said, oh, beloved, why are you putting a hardship on yourself with all these temptations and stuff around you? All you have to do is ask one of these girls, one of your friends, contract with her a marriage for a particular amount of time. And he said, what they won't tell you is that many of the great scholars of the past used to do this. So he was trying to get me to do what the Shia do, the muta. He was trying to get me to do what the Prophet Muhammad had declared to be haram. He had prohibited when there was no necessity for that type of marriage any longer. That once this was legislated in the beginning of Islam, the muta, but there are clear evidence from the, Quran, uh, from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu clear ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which makes that, act, uh, that type of marriage haram. And so this individual wanted me to follow into the shubahat, but it didn't feel right to my heart. That prevented me. So that was a na'mah from Allah to protect me in that matter. And the point being here, is that if you don't know some, whether something is halal or haram, then it's best, best to leave that matter. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and bless us to be of those who practice those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with and stay away from those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.